We are now in this war. So far, the news has been all bad. We have learned that our hemisphere is not immune from severe attack. In the weeks following Pearl Harbor, Americans feared that Japan's march across the Pacific would continue to the west coast of North America. People who thought they were secure, who thought, in fact, the world war was never going to affect them directly, all of a sudden now are living with the realization that the bombs could come the next day, that the next Pearl Harbor could be Vancouver, it could be San Francisco, it could be Los Angeles. Alaska sat particularly vulnerable. The territory's Aleutian Islands were only 750 miles from Japan's closest military base. The Aleutian Islands stretch out like stepping stones toward Japan. If Japan could scramble over these stepping stones from the east and gain a foothold on the mainland of Alaska, she might be able to cripple our shipping in the North Pacific and launch an aerial or amphibious attack against our west coast. War has an insatiable appetite for fuel. There was no certainty that the shipping lanes to Alaska could be kept open. But there was oil available in the north. More than 150 years ago, oil seepage had been noted in northwestern Canada, along the banks of the Great Mackenzie River, only 75 miles from the Arctic Circle. Here at Norman Wells was the most northerly producing field on the North American continent. And this oil had some important virtues. It had a paraffin base, and it had a low pour point, which meant that it would flow at temperatures down to 70 degrees below zero. The United States War Department evolved a plan. With the consent of the Canadian government, it would develop the Norman Wells field until it was capable of producing at least 3,000 barrels a day. At the same time, it would build a pipeline across the bush and rugged mountains 600 miles to Whitehorse, a Yukon town about halfway up the Alaska Highway. Here it would build a refinery to turn the Norman crude into gasoline for planes and trucks. That was the plan. It marked the beginning of the greatest construction job since the Panama Canal. In the extent of area covered, and from the standpoint of sheer pioneering, the pipeline, combined with the Alaska Highway, was destined to become the biggest construction program in the history of the world. It was named Canol, short for Canadian oil. Canol began in the spring of 1942. By June, reconnaissance planes were plotting a route across the virtually unexplored mountains of the Mackenzie-Yukon Divide. Over this wilderness, a pipeline somehow must be built. But in order to build a pipeline, there must first be a road, a road to provide access for construction and year-round maintenance. In fact, a pipeline is 90% road. At present, there wasn't so much as a trail. The civilian contractors who had undertaken the job for the Army knew it would be tough, and they wanted to make sure that the men they hired knew what they were up against. The project briefly employed 25,000 workers and cost about 140 million 1940s dollars to build. The promoters of the Canal project offered post-war prosperity for an entire region. Still, the men came. They came from Texas and Oklahoma, from California, from Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, there were Canadians too. There were welders, carpenters, cooks, iron workers. At the foot of Mount Sheldon, halfway between Whitehorse and Norman Wells, the work was going very slowly. In this locality, there was permanent ground frost. If the insulating vegetation was disturbed, the ground beneath would quickly thaw and become a quagmire. Newcomers to the north learned the hard way, by experience. Shrugging off the cold, they drove their cats day after day against the virgin bush. To pioneer a practical route across this rugged terrain took the combined efforts of hundreds of men and countless pieces of machinery. carved 
its way into the mountains, up canyons, over ridges, striving always to avoid swamps and glacial frost, its dozers hacked out a path for the road builders to follow. Sometimes heavy rains washed down the slopes and flooded the canyon. Where bridges were lacking, trucks were towed across the swollen streams by tractors. Follow-up crews were moving dirt, shaping and widening the road, smoothing the surface, putting in culverts, and building bridges. Cano, unlike any other construction job in history, first had to build its own transportation system, then transport not only its own equipment and machinery, but housing, foodstuffs, and all the trappings of civilization for its thousands of workers. The Cano Road and Pipeline Project was the first and remains one of the most expensive mega projects ever done in northern Canada. First, there was the inland water route down the valley of the Mackenzie to Norman Wells and Cano Camp. Then the string of airfields and the winter road paralleling the water route. Next, the inside passage from Prince Rupert to Skagway and over the narrow gauge railroad to Whitehorse. And finally, the Alaska Highway. These far-flung arteries of supply encompassed an area of hundreds of thousands of square miles, an area strategically important in peace as well as war. The four-inch pipe came in 22-foot lengths, each length weighing about 220 pounds. There was the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the 388th Regiment, mostly from southern states. The Americans met a country that moved on muscle power and a bit of steam. The economy was built on trapping. Even in the 30s, the rich were rich enough for the luxury of fur, and the North weathered the depression in style. In the 1930s, Ross River, Yukon was a fur trading post. Kaska people lived most of the time on trap lines, hunting caribou and mountain sheep, or fishing for salmon. They gathered here in summer when a small steamer brought supplies up the Pelly River. It was a different and independent world. Norman Wells' crude served that economy kerosene for a trapper's lamp. And always the pipe liners kept plugging along behind the road builder. The pipe was laid on the surface of the ground, which simplified construction and maintenance. There was no need to bury it, because the Norman crude would flow at even the coldest temperatures. Cold weather never interfered. Wells were made, and they held, at 40 and 50 degrees below zero. To allow for expansion and contraction, the line was bent and curved to follow the contours of the terrain. Between 1942 and 1944, this incredible workforce bulldozed road, built airports and laid pipeline across a region largely unknown and unmapped over one of the coldest mountain ranges in Canada. As the road builders and pipeliners forged ahead, telephone crews were busy too. Logging crews cut thousands of ancient spruce trees. After dragging them out of the bush, they loosened the bark over a fire and peeled them clean. Once the poles were up, the wire stringers went to work. Now a telephone line paralleled the pipeline. Permanent communication had been established. Storms were violent and prolonged. Traffic was often tied up for hours or even days. On the 16th of February, on McMillan Pass, the truck drivers and cat skinners began to gather shortly before noon. They were here to see their pipeline finished. The superintendent took over to make the golden weld. 
There was no ceremony, no sirens blowing, no champagne to break over the completed pipeline, not even a bottle of beer. This looked just like any other well. But the men watching realized the significance of the occasion. They knew what lay behind it. The final weld was made just 20 months after the first reconnaissance plane flew over the Mackenzie-Yukon divide. Now crude oil from Norman Wells flows across the divide to Whitehorse. At Whitehorse, the oil is digested by the refinery. The job was done in less time than it would take to do an environmental survey today. The United States and Canada dedicated the refinery at Whitehorse April 30th, 1944, in a joint ceremony. Canal was an amazing feat of organization, mechanical and human power. It was also an immense waste of money and resources to a nation at war. Long before it was finished, it was clear that this mega project wasn't needed. Jap submarines had been driven from our Pacific shores. Ships could now use the inside passage up the coast of British Columbia and Alaska without fear. These circumstances favored stepping up the pace of the Canal project rather than slowing it down. We had need to press our advantage. Harry Truman's criticism of Canal's cost overruns helped him become president. More fuel was used to build it, and more oil leaked from the pipe than ever made it to the Whitehorse refinery. In 1945, the pipeline was abandoned within months of its completion. The oil from Norman Wells found a cheaper, easier way south. Even the Whitehorse refinery was cut up and shipped to Alberta. What couldn't be quickly salvaged was left behind. The story of Canal is not a favorite of those retelling World War II. The Alaska Highway is the success story, and Canal, a hasty footnote. Right, I see it. I see it. You can't miss it. Huh? They, they give away our yellow lanterns. 
Right, a right one and a, and a mustard color one. Yeah. Okay. Can't miss it. Go in. Get get the pictures. And, and the pictures are on top of the computer. On the computer. Okay. And you'll see the you'll see look around. You see computer. Yeah. I could have I could have got to that guy uh, Pete doing it. He's too busy being a big shot with his like, uh, tripod. Like a movie director, right? That Pete guy.
This little, uh, <laughs> this little contraption here <laughs> is um, a shower for the dressing room that Chris is setting up. It sucks water from the river, and uh, sprays on in. Pretty nice.
Here we are, making a new trail because the other one washed out. Had to cut down a bunch of the, the brush in the middle here of the track so you can see how the track used to go all the way out and it was overgrown it quite the canopy above us Here's a strange find. This would be a go anywhere vehicle with those tracks. It's got tracks on it, not wheels back here. Pretty cool stuff.
past that point. Yeah, right? It might not be that bad. Surprised you climbed up out of the campsite so easily with the trailer. on the ride Hurricane is blowing Oh, there's a twister on the ride I can feel the bad weather coming I don't believe it's all in my mind Stay to the river Oh, you better watch the desert sand You people better run for cover I believe your time is close at hand The quad track doesn't look that bad either. What? The quad track. Well, it's the first 30 feet of it. It's though. just here, and then you're okay. Free. What do you think then? I say the quad track. Well, we could do that. Bridging and I mean, the quad track. Winches. Yeah, we just use bridging and uh, get us, you know, slowly moving. So there's our problem: the beaver dam. Those damn yeah, beavers. You know, you get an expedition of guys, they run into a little beaver. 
I would <laughs> feel like to see the destruction. But I think we should, you know, make, realize that we may have to uh, pull somebody or win somebody in a uh, uh, 109 uh, with the uh, green uh, and level and uh, lamp limestone. Can you be more specific? <laughs> <laughs> With a toilet seat now on the side. <laughs> Actually, it's not limestone, it's a... And a sleepy passenger. Mind you say, yeah. <laughs> it's getting all scratched. I don't know if it's going to feel the same anymore. <laughs> <laughs>
we really battled it out yesterday. We made 12k. There's no um, road anymore that we can find. There's just uh, rocks and bush. So we're uh, kind of following a horse trail and um, yesterday my uh, drain plug for the transfer case fell out somewhere and I could hear my gear train whining so I stopped and we walked back about a mile we couldn't find anything so I had to take the cover off the transfer case and we put a wooden plug in it and it seems to be working great we filled the oil and the repair is good what's behind me is the road or the way to it we don't know uh, we're gonna drive across the river again and uh, we have to go upstream here somewhere cross over to that far side the road's up the hill there somewhere The road went on the other side of the mountain, eh? I bet we got it wrong. Looks like we might have found the road again, which is good news. There are telegraph poles, and they found some other artifacts, drums and things. So we think we've got it again, finally. Fine. Here you can see one of the forget what they call them, I guess we'll have to find that out later, but the old cabooses. Hey. The workers used to stay in, they dragged them along behind the dozers.
So we think we've come to the Ram's Head Lodge. The airstrip is just ahead as well. There's a lot of horses out here. Apparently there's a building with some people, maybe a couple aircraft. I think I might see a helicopter up there. They don't seem to be too friendly. I waved and peered in wave back. I don't think I'm pulling in there. Me neither. <laughs> 